Hi, I'm Femi OK. On today's bonus edition of The Stream, some of the best TV from recent shows, and I'm going to give you a backstage pass so you can see candid conversations I had with the guests after the live broadcasts. Coming up, Nigerians who love Twitter are in shock. The app has been indefinitely suspended and apparently it's now illegal to tweet in Nigeria. Nigerians on Instagram weigh in. COVID health risks at the Tokyo Olympics are making the headlines. The International Olympic Committee is facing public pressure to postpone or even cancel this year's game. Spoiler alert, that's not going to happen. We'll take you behind the scenes with both experts and athletes. First, one of the biggest academic scandals in America with one of the country's best-known journalists. When Pulitzer Prize-winning writer Nicole Hannah-Jones wasn't immediately offered a tenure position at her alma mater after the university had recommended her, it started so many conversations. Here on the stream, we asked, what is it like to be a black professor in the United States? After the show, I got the guests to tell me their horror stories. <laughs> well, <laughs> mine would start with even applying to graduate schools in the first place, where um, my undergraduate advisor suggested that I not apply to the top programs, that I wasn't going to get into any of them. Um, when I did get into all of the ones that I applied to, he was quite shocked and said to me that it was probably a slow year for admissions and that that's why I got mm. in. Um, so that was the start of many different instances where um, my credibility and my competence are questioned by colleagues, even by students mm -hmm. on occasion. It's, it happens more, I think, with colleagues than with students, but it does sometimes occur um, in terms of student evaluations mm -hmm. of students thinking that I was probably hired because of affirmative action, which maybe I was, <laughs> but that's seen as mm -hmm. um, a slight and that I must not mm -hmm. um, really be qualified for the job. I've been um, questioned by colleagues about my appearance, that I don't look professional, that my hair or what I'm choosing to, to wear that no one's going to be able to take me seriously because of the way I look. These things have actually happened. Malena. Yeah, I would say mine was, um, the, the one I'll share is um, during a job interview. It was my first time on the job market. And back then, um, you went to the Modern Language Association, the MLA, and you had an interview in a room. And so it's just you with sort of like five interviewers at this university. And uh, this was a poor position in American U.S. literature. And I, that was one of my major fields that I was trained in. And they kept asking me how I would teach, you know, sort of these famous writers like Herman Melville and Nathaniel Hawthorne and Edgar Allan Poe, and I'm prepared for all of this. You know, I did my mock interviews. I'm totally prepared. And then one man in exasperation says, but how would you teach any of that? Can you teach any of that without talking about slavery and race? Could you just not talk about that? And I said, well, I'm a, I'm a scholar of, of slavery. And so my approach to this literature is to understand its intersections. All of it was antebellum U.S. literature for during the period of slavery. So there's slaves in every text or references to slavery in every text. And the idea that you know, I could, why can't you talk about something else when this is actually my research? Um, so I would say that it just kind of undercuts you and makes you think twice. Like, what will it be like if you're actually there with, with someone doing this just in an interview? Mm -hmm. Martha. I've had a series of um, curious experiences very recently. I think they're partly a function of um, joining new uh, configurations of folks, committees and the like, um, via Zoom. People don't know each other. They don't see each other. Now, um, one of the things that we all know is that we are oftentimes the only one in the room, right? The only one on the committee, the only one on the Zoom. And um, my experience very recently has been um, clearly people not seeing me and um, beginning to talk in a very curious we and I realize that behind the scenes, my white colleagues talk in the we about themselves as white people, um, as elite people, um, as privileged people. Um, and it's twice now I have stumbled into these conversations and I have to raise the Zoom hand and say, excuse me, I'm, I, you know, the we doesn't really work in this room because I'm here. Um, but it has been a window into um, sort of the other side of the equation and how folks, even when we're in the room, 
don't see us, don't discern us, um, don't account for us, um, and move and make decisions by way of deep logics that assume they are the default, um, their perspective is the default or the, even the majority perspective. Um, and I'm finding myself in the thick of that struggle even today. Martha Jones, Robin Autry and Malena Doubt giving us a glimpse into their challenges working in academia in America. It's been a quiet week on Nigerian Twitter. I miss you, Niger Twitter family. Last week, the government banned the app and then threatened anyone who continues to tweet with prison time. Days into the ban, I spoke to Adiola Fayoun, the host of Keeping It Real with Adiola. She joined me on the AJ Stream Instagram Live series. Adiola is not impressed with how President Buhari's administration is handling its current social media crisis. Well, the whole thing has just been ridiculous. It's one of those things that you never thought could happen in Nigeria. Because I have reported issues like this in Ethiopia, in Uganda, in different African countries. I never thought that I would report this happening in Nigeria. Now, one of the reasons why it's so ridiculous is the Nigerian government, whenever they want to make an announcement or a condolence, which is what they do most times when people are kidnapped, instead of rescuing them, the president has a condolence template. All this information I released on Twitter, on the president's Twitter page. And all the presidential advisors, all the media aides, this is where they make their announcement. I mean, they cannot be making their announcement on Instagram. Instagram is not really that serious a platform when it comes to politics. Twitter is the way to go when it comes to politics. So this is what the Nigerian government has been using to communicate with us. And suddenly, because the president's tweets did not follow I mean, Twitter's guideline, the president has decided not only would he not patronize Twitter, but he doesn't want 200 million people to have the freedom to choose whether or not they have a beef with Twitter. So if he has a beef with Twitter, it's none of our business. Like, Twitter has their own guidelines. If you can follow the guideline, then get out of the line. But this idea that Twitter... Um, shut you down and because of that nobody else should use Twitter again that's just childish so that has been why it's been so ridiculous and right now we don't even know where to get information from the presidency because the presidency is no longer on Twitter because of personal beef NTA which is the Nigerian Television Authority has never been clear since I was born I'm not sure about before I was born and they don't have a staple online presence how would the rest of Nigerians outside of Nigeria get to know any information from the presidency? So it's like they're sabotaging themselves, really. And so for ordinary Nigerians on the streets, being told right now that they can be arrested for having Twitter on their phones, and they just the National Broadcasting Corporation, Nigeria Broadcasting Corporation, issued a statement today warning all TV stations, all radio stations, not to patronize Twitter, to, de to uninstall their Twitter handles. And it's just been amazing seeing how some radio stations are fighting back that this is against our fundamental human rights. If you have a problem with Twitter, we don't have a problem with Twitter. Your enemy doesn't have to be our enemy. But they're not getting it. That's the unfortunate thing. It feels strange being online right now on Twitter without all of my Niger family. It feels quite lonely. There are people working around that using a VPN, which is the typical go-to tool. Mm -hmm. Whenever authorities, whenever a country says, OK, Twitter is now locked down, there is a workaround. How, are you seeing that? I'm seeing a little bit of that with hashtag keep well, it on, which is what Twitter uh, tweeted out. Uh, on Saturday uh, to support Nigerians rallying around, please bring back Twitter to Nigeria. Well, on the first day, a lot of people downloaded VPN trying to use Twitter. But then it was after that that the Nigerian Broadcasting Corporation said no TV or radio station is allowed. That means even if you have a VPN, you're not allowed. And the Attorney General of the Federation has said that he has given an order that now using Twitter will be criminalized. So even if you have a VPN, then you're breaking the law by using it. 
You know, the sad thing in all of this is we have pressing issues. We have so many things that we're supposed to focus on as a nation. It just doesn't make sense that Twitter is what the, is what the president is focusing on. The Minister of Information lied Mohammed. The day Twitter banned, I mean, deleted Buhari's tweet, he, had a, he held a press conference. This man, we didn't know he could hold a press conference the same day an event happened. Because every time students are kidnapped, hundreds of students, he had never held a, a press conference on the same day. Every time there is bomb explosion, every time Boko Haram kills people, every time that people die, he never held a press conference the same day. People are complaining about the price of, of things, like the, the price of fuel, the price of everything went up. He never held a press conference that same day. But because Twitter deleted Buari's tweet, the man had a press conference that same day. And we're just really upset because there are so many pressing issues that they could focus on. Unfortunately, they like to focus on misplaced priorities. So who are they helping right now? Like, I, I'm just wondering if they feel accomplished right now because they banned Twitter. You couldn't boast of fixing the roads. You couldn't boast of giving us stable electricity. You couldn't boast on ensuring security, but you're feeling good that you banned Twitter. It just doesn't make sense. It makes you wonder what happened to the elderly people in the land. Because these are the elderly people. And we, they say with age comes wisdom, but we're not seeing that right now. Now, I, I, so, want, I wonder that. Some, some of the responses here. Um, he must be another Trump. Uh, uh, the, the, this picking up on uh, the other part of Nigeria who are dreaming to be leaders. It's a clueless government right there. How should one man's headache impose over 200 million Nigerians? All right, so um, those are some thoughts, obviously um, not coming from uh, a government perspective, but I'm wondering whether this is a generation issue. If the government's or the head of the information ministry was, let's say, even 20 years younger. Do you think Twitter would be banned right now? Oh, no, I don't think it will. I think you're right. I think it has to do with generational issues. Mm. But then when you, when you say that, though, it makes me wonder about their children. All those who have children, all their children studied abroad. I always wonder if their children don't talk to them. Like, Lai Mohamed, the Minister of Information, bless his soul, bless his soul. But that man is beyond redemption when it comes to Nigeria. It's mainly because, first of all, he lies. He lies point black. Second of all, he's so outdated. Adio, so you, you were saying this from the, this from the safety of the United States, right? Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I'm sure if they could ban my show, they would have a long time ago. Yeah. But the man is so outdated, which is why I always wonder about their kids. Don't their children talk to them? Don't Buhari's children talk to, to him? Don't the vice president's kids talk to him? This, this is what I don't understand. All their children studied abroad. All Buhari's children studied abroad. They're young. They know what's going on. Don't, don't they talk to their parents? about what's right and what's not right. Can they talk to them about Twitter? Twitter is just a social media platform, just like Facebook, just like Instagram, just like TikTok. You know, I don't know why they think, <laughs> I don't know why they think they have some kind of victory by doing this. So we can say it's a generational thing, but they have the younger generation in their homes. But I guess the problem is they don't listen to their kids. One of my favorite tweets from this week was from stream guest Soraya Lenny, who posted after our Iranian election show with enthusiasm, a panel on Iran where everyone is of Iranian heritage too? Well, that is just how we roll on the stream. Also on that show, Asel Rad, senior fellow at the Iranian American Council. I asked Asel how the US government sees the presidential election on June the 18th and what impact that might have for a nuclear deal. Uh, the U.S. is negotiating with Iran right now. But keep in mind that uh, President Biden came in um, to came into a situation where the Trump administration's maximum pressure policy was in full effect. And for with all intents and purposes, it is still in full effect. Not one sanction has been lifted, despite the fact that we're in uh, negotiations with Iran right now in terms of the nuclear deal. 
that has an impact on the election as well. Had the Biden administration approached it differently from the very beginning, had they approached it the way that they did things like the Paris Climate Accord or the Muslim ban and taken immediate steps into returning to the deal, which I think a lot of his supporters expected him to do, uh, then you might find a different situation. If sanctions had, if some sanctions had been lifted and Iranians experienced uh, the idea of economic relief, then maybe there would be some enthusiasm for voting and it could change the sort of political um, environment that you see in Iran today. But this is the path that the Biden, Biden administration has taken. And something to keep in mind is Iranians are not naive to the fact that, yes, there's they're very aware of their domestic uh, mismanagement and corruption that leads to these economic situations, but they're also very aware of the role of sanctions. Mm. And when I speak to family and friends in Iran, they say it's like the war in the 1980s. I mean, that is a very different situation than it was just a few years ago. And so the role of U.S. sanctions can't be... Um, can't be denied. Sure. Soraya, I'm just really curious about when Rouhani started his presidency four years ago and how he's ending his presidency four years ago. What is your takeaway? Well, eight years ago, 2013, eight years ago, uh, when, he was, when he was elected, he was elected in, in this wave of optimism and hope. It was the, the administration of moderation and hope. That's what all of the posters said. That's what everybody believed. Mm -hmm. And it's very difficult now to describe uh, just how excited people were in 2013, coming after that eight-year period of Ahmadinejad, uh, the Bush administration as well, part of that in the United States. So it was a very dark period of time. And I can say that what is happening now, eight years later, unfortunately, it really is back to the future where there's been almost a full circle where they've gone through those dark days. Uh, it looked very much like, you know, war was on the horizon. There were, under the Obama administration, heavy sanctions as well. And then, of course, there was the JCPOA, and once again, that renewed optimism and hope, and, you know, that Rouhani could change something, that he was changing something uh, in signing that accord. And then eight years later, we're effectively back to the beginnings. Sorry, I want to put this point to you. This comes from Amin. Amin is a project researcher at the University of Tehran. He has a theory about why conservatives are now in favor and moderates are not in favor. You don't have to agree with it, but I'm really interested about your take. Let's have a listen to Amin, first of all. I believe the separance of the so-called moderates from Iran's politics would be one of the most important results of the upcoming presidential election in Iran. The decision of Guardian Council showed that the Islamic Republic doesn't need reformists or moderates for its future. Uh, they failed to fulfill the demands of the Islamic Republic in the nuclear deal and currently due to the eagerness of the Joe Biden administration to rejoin the JCPOA, Tehran believes without moderates can gain more concessions from the U.S. Basically, moderates had their chance, they had eight years, look where we are, this is why conservatives are going to be, do well. No, I absolutely... Uh, no, I, I disagree with that uh, mostly because, mm -hmm. yes, moderates had their chance, but for the past eight years, hardliners have spent that time undermining the Rouhani administration, uh, putting obstacles in his way and trying to prevent the administration from carrying out its promises. Hardliners, for the most part, were uh, in opposition to the JCPOA, uh, including when, you know, it was ratified through the parliament. You had parliament parliamentarians, hardline parliamentarians, some of them actually crying. Uh, they were that upset about this. And it's not just that. They've undermined his uh, demands for reform, for moderation, for other sorts of, you know, important issues uh, that he that he campaigned on in not just 2013, but, of course, 2017. And, yes, fine, moderates have had a, a chance. So there is this internal problem within Iran and this internal opposition, uh, which, is, uh, which is important and it cannot be discounted. But then you have, on the alternative side, you can look at the past, uh, you know, 20 years of uh, Iranian presidential elections. You know, they've elected a populist, they've elected a hardliner, a reformist, a moderate, a pragmatist. Uh, but... The United States, on the other hand, the U.S. position in Washington towards Iran has changed in a very limited way. So I think that part of the problem is that the shift in Washington hasn't happened mm -hmm. towards Iran to allow the, the changed atmosphere within Iran to really take hold. Finally, we head into an Olympic-sized controversy. How do you hold a major global sporting event 
during a pandemic. The Olympics were postponed last year, of course, but they appear to be going ahead this July and COVID is still with us. Many in Japan are unhappy with the International Olympic Committee and the Japanese government for forging ahead with the Games despite the risks. Richard Pound, a member of the International Olympic Committee, joined me to talk about the safety measures in place. He then listened in to the other guests discussing their concerns. After the broadcast, I asked Richard if he'd heard anything during the discussion that may have changed his mind. This does not change my mind at all. I, you know, we, we are seeking out the best medical and scientific advice that we can, and we're following that. We have no interest in, in exposing Olympic athletes, Japanese uh, spectators, any spectators, anybody to uh, unnecessary risk. The, the minimum of measures have not been done, and that includes ventilation. That includes, if you're going to make masks, you know, we know that masks are important. Why would you make athletes bring their own? And, you know, we know that, you know, temperature screening absolutely does not work. It's a ridiculous optic that is nothing but theatre. We know that, you know, sanitation has got nothing to do, you know, cleaning the surface has got nothing to do with cleaning the air. This is COVID. This is aerosol an airborne virus we're talking about, can we drop the optics in the theatre? And also, given things like temperature screening, 37.5, that's discriminatory against women, against blacks, against younger athletes. Richard, I, I, I had to find this picture because I know that you're an athlete, so you're not just making this decision and you're not just saying this as a bureaucrat. You competed. You were pretty phenomenal. In Canada, you're a legend. This is you as a young man when you were a competitive swimmer. Athlete to athlete. Rips, yeah. <laughs> There's a little six pack going on there. Athlete to <laughs> athlete. Megan, what would you like to say honestly, candidly? Only you two know what it is like to be an Olympian. Yeah, I mean, I think, and this this ex expands, and, and Richard, you've been on the IOC for a while now, so this isn't a, a, a new, I think, request, and there's a lot more conversation being had about the IOC's responsibility and role for, and I'll just term it athlete welfare. Um, and I think that that's, you know, it, it leans into, you know, Dr. Sparrow's, you know, kind of these demands on taking the measures that should be taken to protect athletes and obviously the surrounding volunteers and spectators. But beyond that, the IOC, more than optics, um, really understanding the role of the athletes is there's no Olympics without the athletes. And it's no secret now, we've seen it covered in the media, the disparities between um, what athletes get, I'll say, out of the Olympics versus, you know, the executives and um, the people who really benefit from the Olympics. And I think that is that is part of this argument and part of the need and call for making sure that everything is done to take care of the athletes as well. Um, that's, that's, that would be my, that's my role. That's my responsibility, right? As an athlete to demand the best experience because we're surely not getting a ton of money from this, <laughs> but the best experience. And that means safety, um, the whole, you know, the, as much safety as possible. I, I, I would, uh, I share all of that. And, but as an athlete, I would say, listen, whatever you can do to make these games happen safely, Let's do it. We'll we'll take the inconveniences and and, uh, and and so forth. But what we really want are athletes from 206 now take out North Korea, 205 countries, to have a chance to compete against each other. And and uh, that's what we really want. Uh, we're not in it for the money. We just don't want to be put at unnecessary risk. And we rely on you uh, as the IOC uh, and, and the, the Japanese authorities to make sure that we don't do that. And, and, and if you say we're satisfied and safe, good, I'll rely on that advice. Um, so I'm, I've been hearing the experts' opinions and I hear the lots of talks about the safety for the athletes. But again, I want to emphasize where we are in Japan. Like I am speaking, I mean, I'm working from Osaka, uh, where the last month alone, we had like over 10,000 people waiting to be hospitalized because we didn't have enough nurses and doctors in hospital beds. And many people died even without being admitted to the hospital. That's the situation we are in. And I have two elderly parents, and my father especially has a heart condition. He hasn't even been able to make a reservation for vaccination. And the other day, he broke his uh, his foot, and I was scared. He had a, If he had a heart, more serious injuries, 
he wouldn't have gone he wouldn't have a place to go to and that's how much of the edge we are living in and to hear that the olympic dream i know it's significant for the athletes and i really respect that but we want we are talking about this level of day to day disruption happening so the dreams are great but we all have dreams and we all have loved ones lives at, on the line and i want to emphasize that again and that's our show for today thanks for watching see you next time Thank you.